Alrighty, here we go. Good afternoon, parents and families, and welcome to our What's Buzzing at Georgia Tech webinar series. I would like to just say thank you for joining us as we embark on a new semester, the spring 2021 semester. We're so thankful to have you here with us today. If you are a returner uh, in regards to a parent or a family member who is familiar with our webinar series, please know that we are looking to continue our uh, connection with our campus partners and also our Dean of Students to just bring you uh, updates about things that are going on in Georgia Tech to help you be successful. If you're new, uh, this is a webinar series that we created for uh, parents and family members to virtually connect to us on campus so that way we can spread the good news about Georgia Tech, talk about some ways to support your student, and also just have some of your questions answered as well. Today, we are welcomed by our Vice President of Student Life and Dean of Students, John Stein, who is here to just talk about a few things for this upcoming uh, spring semester. And also just, he wants to hear from you and um, answer some of your questions that you may have about your student. So if you give me a few moments, um, I'll upload our presentation and then we'll hear from Dean Stein. If you also, if you have any questions, please, please feel free to utilize the Q&A chat box uh, which should be off to the right of your screen uh, so that way you can drop your questions in there and then Dean and Stein will get to them at the end. Further ado, uh, we would like to welcome Dean Stein. Greetings from Atlanta and from Georgia Tech. Thank you for joining us today. So what I want to do today is just kind of give you an overview as we start spring semester. Um, as Tyler said, there's a webinar series with the uh, campus colleagues from across the Institute that will speak more specifically on different issues um, and you know different departments and stuff. But today um, I want to give you an overview. So I'm going to give you some information on key dates for spring term that you should be aware of. Then I'm going to talk to you about ways that your student can engage on campus, whether they are physically here or home or someplace else. I want to remind you of the mental health resources on campus and give you a sense of how things played out fall semester and then give you some basic information on COVID related um, information on testing and stuff. So that's the plan and then we'll spend some time for Q&A. Um, so the first slide here you can see there are some key dates. One of them is today. It's a very, very important date and that's fee payment is due today. So um, please note that uh, if the fee is not paid, the students uh, classes can be canceled. So if there's any issue with this, uh, it is very, very important to get to the bursar's office today. Um, uh, try to reach them online or by phone and negotiate something out with them so that they know payment is coming. But this is a, an important day because by mid to end of the week, uh, typically uh, there's a list of students whose classes were canceled for failure. Um, to pay, so um, be aware of that. Okay, on February 22nd is progress report grades are due. This is mostly for 1,000, 2,000 level classes, mostly impacts first and second year students. It is the first read on how they're doing academically in their classes. It's an S or a U. Okay, they will see that online. You will not unless they give you permission, but I do recommend that you ask them about them and what kind of uh, progress report grades they received. Now what I want to say is that sometimes that you may be based on one exam. Uh, so don't get too overly concerned uh, because there'll still be plenty of time in the semester to you know turn that you around. But it is it's an important first read uh, that students receive in their courses. March 16th uh, is a break. OK, that is a day. We will not have spring break this uh, spring, 
uh, due to COVID, but we will have two days, March 16th and March 24th, where we have days off. Now these are days that there'll be no classes. There should be no assignments due. It should truly be a day to just take a break, all right, both for the faculty um, and for our students. Uh, administrative offices will be open, uh, but the students and faculty will have a day off. Um, it, it, students will, I know students are upset. We don't have spring break. Uh, and the only reason we're not doing that is because of COVID related concerns and stuff. Um, and these fall on during the week. So I think the first one is Tuesday and then the 24th, um, I believe is a Wednesday. That was purposely done so that they don't turn into long weekends where students then would go away. So, you know, I, I, we've had to really think these things through very carefully and work with student leaders to come to an agreement. March 17th is the withdrawal deadline. Very, very important date. It's the date that students can withdraw um, without penalty. Uh, after you go through that date, then you are kind of stuck in those classes. So it's very important that if something is going on and there's a need to withdraw, <clears throat> they do it by the 17th. Uh, great substitution deadline, um, which students know about is March 17th also. So March 17th is an important day to remember. The final instruction day is April 26th, which feels like it's a very far off date, but I do want to say that that is 90 days from tomorrow, and those 90 days will go by very quickly. So the semester usually uh, is a very quick one, and um, you know, uh, students, are, that's 90 days. That's not 90 class days. So if you reduce it down to class days, you can see that uh, this semester will move. And then we move into reading days, and then finally um, our final exam period. So those are the key dates. Um, you should be aware of it. More importantly, they should be aware of these dates. If there's any concern, any question about them, they can contact us and we can review them. So next slide, please. So, you know, one of the things that uh, we learned last semester was the need for students to engage um, either virtually in person, a combination of those two um, so that they have a sense of belonging and connection to the Institute, to each other um, and to the different activities and stuff. And we ended up having many, many different activities last semester and we're going to have even more this semester and it will be a combination of virtual and in person. Already in the first two weeks, we've had a movie night in the first year. We had 70 students attend that uh, with the proper social distancing and stuff. We had a number of student MLK celebrations. Um, the student one was virtual. It was very well done. Uh, a part of it was live, um, but that was the performers uh, in the theater. Everyone else was watching. We had a student leader retreat. We had an engaged symposium that first weekend um, that hundreds of students logged on and attended and stuff. So um, that first weekend back was a very busy, very active one. And then you can see some of the things that are being planned for spring term. Okay, uh, there'll be movie nights at Bobby Dodd. There'll be a spring comedy show and this list will continue to grow. Okay, and the two places that students should be checking um, to see what is happening is the weekly digest that is sent out every Monday. I know because I send it out. It is from the student uh, the Center for Student Engagement that lists the different activities going on that week. Okay, and then there's the daily digest that's sent out by the Institute. That's a combination of news and also different um, activities and different events, different lectures. Uh, that are happening, okay? Those are two very important documents that students can, you know, link on to and learn about things. Every time I read those, I learn about things that are happening. I did it this morning and I learned about something I didn't realize was going on. There's a lot going on here. It's a very big place and there's a lot of different people planning things. So it's important to kind of know where you can go to find out that information. But and you know again, there's a tremendous um, intentional push to engage our students who are not physically on this campus, 
um, but in, enrolled this semester um, from someplace else. Next slide. So mental health, uh, you know, it's an ongoing uh, high priority for us. Uh, we are committed to it. The Institute has invested a great deal of time and money uh, and effort in creating what we have. What I want to say is that when we reviewed the fall semester, there were 9,216 points of contact with students. Okay, that's a combination of telebehavioral health, case consultation, follow ups, groups, but over 9,000 points of contact. Right? That's a very impressive number. And in peak weeks of the semester, um, they were averaging the three centers, and I'll remind you of the three centers, psychiatry, counseling center, and GT care. They are averaging, those three were averaging over 500 points of contact with students. Okay. The spring term will have a total of 38 mental health professionals as part of our staff. There are five in care, 24 in the counseling center, and nine in psychiatry. Um, I'm happy to say we added three new staff to the counseling center. They're in place now. Um, we've hired them. Uh, they've been oriented and they are already seeing students and uh, working with groups and stuff. And we are in the process of hiring two additional staff in our care. So uh, that's a total of five new uh, mental health professionals uh, that have, will be joining or have joined us. Next slide, please. So I want to bring this to your attention. Uh, this is something that I discovered today uh, when I was reviewing uh, the Daily Digest and stuff. The Counseling Center is now doing a program called Let's Talk. They've done this in the past, uh, but every Monday from 4 to 5 and Thursdays from 11 to 12, they will have a counselor available to do a confidential consultation conversation. Okay. Um, all you need to do, it's a virtual walk-in through the week. And, you know, it, it can last 15 minutes. It could last a little bit longer. But, you know, if, you're ha if your student is having a bad day, if something happened, if they just feel like they need to talk to someone, this is a great way to connect um, with someone. Okay. And it's a steady one. And the listing today in the Daily Digest lists all the dates and they're averaging somewhere between four and five or more a month. So um, in addition to everything else going on, uh, this semester the Counseling Center is also offering 14 different groups that students can get um, engaged in if they choose. Um, GT Care is always available for an assessment consultation uh, that they have access to uh, virtually and stuff. We have found that students respond very, very positively to the virtual telebehavioral health. Um, and, you know, probably for the future, we, we're going to keep this in, in connection, in relation to our uh, virtual, in person kind of therapy that we do because students have responded and have shared that they actually do like this model. So, next slide. So I also want to announce that uh, we are in a partnership with the University System of Georgia. They have created a mental health initiative. We're very appreciative of this for the University System. And they are partnering with two different organizations. Um, and we reap the benefits of that. And so we have Thrive at Georgia Tech, which will give students other options in addition to what we're offering. And we created a um, GT Wellness Hub, and that's the link to it. Um, that information will be, if it hasn't been already, will be sent out to students so that they are aware of that. So in addition to everything that Georgia Tech is offering, we're now partnering with the University Systems Mental Health Initiative uh, to create even more. So next slide. In relation to COVID, you know, I just want to remind you that testing continues. Uh, students are strongly encouraged to test twice after returning. 
Now, last week we had a very, very successful testing week. There was a real push as students came back uh, to test. And one day last week, we had over 4,000 members of the community test on one day. Um, and it was a very successful week for us. So it is very convenient. Okay, there is um, testing sites all over the campus and I get tested on a weekly basis and I've never really had to wait for any significant amount of time uh, in terms of walking in and doing it. So this is an important piece. We don't want students to get lulled into thinking that they don't need to do it. They should continue to do it. OK, um, and you know this gives us a read on the community and what it does is allow us to hone in on different areas where it's showing some kind of spike or uh, a rising population, whether that's a residence hall, a Greek house, a sector of the campus. Um, we can see that um, based on you know all of the information uh, that comes in and then hone in and do an intervention in those areas. Next. So we have uh, vaccinations. Um, they were uh, delivered and uh, vaccination dis distribution has begun. Uh, we're working very closely with the Department of Health in terms of the timing and distribution of vaccines. Okay, they give us the script that we need to follow. We are currently in phase 1A um, and then we will move into 1B, which is faculty, staff and affiliates and then persons aged 16 to 64 with medical conditions that increase the risk of severe illness, including students, and then phase two are students. The phase we're in now is for faculty, staff, and affiliates who are 65 or older, or who have documented that they are the caregiver for someone um, in that age bracket. Okay, so that's the phase we're in and we will move into 1B at some point. Now, the question, most common question we get is timing of when we'll move to 1B, 1C. And as Dr. Holton says, it, it's a difficult kind of answer to give very specific information. It depends on the number of vaccines we have um, and you know the timing. What we can say is that when we move into 1B, that's a very large group of individuals. OK, um, that's the bulk of the community is 1B uh, for faculty, staff and, and affiliates, followed by phase two, which would be our students. So 1A um, should take a, a few weeks and then we should be uh, moving into the 1B uh, phase. So and again, you can always get updates on this at the uh, link that's listed there. Um, it's updated daily and you have you have access to that and your student has access to that. Okay, next slide. All right, I think that's broadly what I wanted to review. And now I am happy to answer any questions that you might have. Again, my recommendation is that you look at the schedule for these different webinars and find the ones that you're interested in. Okay, find the ones of the staff uh, it'll be a great combination uh, Two a week ago Friday. We did a webinar in the evening on health and safety with our chief of police and our um, medical director of the health center. And we had over about 180 individuals, family members and stuff join us. And so, you know, we do see the benefit of this. It gives us a chance to give you some information. It gives us a chance for us to get some questions from you and to kind of know what information you're looking for. So uh, we see great value and we'll continue to offer these. Thank you so much, Dean Stein, for uh, just touching on those <coughs> points of information, just taking the time out your schedule to be with us. Now what we'll do, parents and family members, please uh, feel free to drop questions in the Q&A chat box. Uh, we know that we're all excited about this spring semester. Uh, we know that many of you have spent an extended amount of time with your students um, over the extended winter break. Um, so you may have learned something new about them. Um, you may have discovered something, a new passion, new interest or concern. So please feel free to drop that in the Q&A. But Dean Stein, the first question that we have 
Uh, my son dropped one of his classes on Thursday, January 21st. Will he receive a refund for this class? No, no, no. Uh, you, you don't receive individual refunds on courses and stuff. It's um, if you're over 12 credits, then it's, you know, uh, you pay the uh, the tuition. So uh, that's no. So the answer there is uh, no. But uh, the point, though, with this is, you know, just to make sure for financial aid scholarships or whatever, that their status is either full or part time. OK, minimum 12 credits to be, to be considered a full time student. <clears throat> My students are overwhelmed by all the emails they get. I know that they don't read the digest. Is there a website they could access to see what events are upcoming? Uh, that would be a great addition to the digest. Yeah, there is. There is one uh, and Willie will send it to Tyler so that he can send it out. But there's a student uh, in there's a engagement website that lists all of the different activities uh, and you can break it down by month. You can look at just January you can, and link on to February. So we'll send that and then yes. he can send that out. Yes, I'll post okay. that shortly. Mm -hmm. Uh, when will the school calendar for the summer be published? Uh, yes, indeed, the spring semester will go out very quickly, and it would be helpful to know the summer calendar in order to plan ahead. Three. There are three working groups right now. Uh, I'm a part of one of them. Uh, obviously, there's there was the spring one to figure out this semester. There's a summer working group, and that's the one I'm on. We're looking at all of the different options for courses um, for summer term and then there's one looking at fall term so i would say that um, probably uh, for purposes of registration and all of that this has to happen pretty quickly so i'm going to guesstimate by early february that information will be available to all of you <clears throat> and again, let me just say, <clears throat> excuse me, the intention is that as we move through this and move ahead, that we will have more in person classes for students. OK, that's the intention, uh, but we also have to see where we are in relation to COVID, uh, both nationally and, you know, in the area in which we are and stuff. But uh, that's kind of um, everyone's intention is to slowly continue to increase um, and get back to a place safely uh, that we all want to get back to. What percentage increase of students are on campus this semester compared to last semester? Will there be a push for single occupancy rooms in the coming weeks like there was in the fall to increase social distancing overall? Yeah, so I think there was a net gain of about five hundred new students. OK, uh, you know, I think there was a thousand shift in and out, but a net gain of about 500. So, um, you know, uh, I think they're trying. It, we usually give students the first two weeks to settle in, to arrive, to get courses uh, set, to get fees paid. Um, and then from there we assess what we have in terms of room inventory and what the possibilities are. So I would say that if your student is interested in single occupancy, they should work with their hall director uh, and with the residence life staff to um, ask the question of what is available, where it's available, um, and see if that's an option for them. <clears throat> Would you mind expounding on what a affiliate is under phase 1B of the vaccination rollout? Sure, yes, yeah, so we have uh, staff here that um, are part of our community. Uh, an example would be our, our chaplains. They work with students, they have houses on campus, many of them, but they're not employed by Georgia Tech. They're employed by whatever denomination they are a part of. Um, but their residency is here at Tech um, for a given year, okay? And so uh, it's very important that the staff in, that are in those categories 
that are working with our students in their company and stuff also um, have access to things. And so they are officially kind of known to us and they go th through a process um, through our HR to be classified as an affiliate. But that's one example of what an affiliate would be. Once faculty are vaccinated, should we see more face-to-face -face classes? You know, I, you know, I, I, that's our, our hope, I'll, honestly, let's say. But I think what faculty would say is that we'd like students to be vaccinated also. So it's this kind of uh, give and uh, take back and forth between both parties really wanting that. Um, you know, I think some, what I've heard from students as I talk to them is that some faculty have said, you know, we're going to take the first six weeks and do this hybrid, do it virtually, and then we're going to reassess at that point, and we might increase in-person classes when we see where we are, okay? So I think there's an openness to doing that um, for later on in the semester. Uh, the next question is, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for this session today. Uh, could GT publish weekly vaccination statistics about uh, like how many vaccinations received and I guess administered? Great point. Uh, let me bring that to the task force. The task force meets every Tuesday morning and I will uh, bring that question as someone who sits on the task force and ask if that is a possibility if we could add that to a website. Great point. What medical what medical conditions are considered increased risk? Underlying conditions. So uh, your physician probably the student's physician would probably make a case for that. My understanding would be uh, asthma might be one underlying condition uh, and some other medical issues. OK, and what we're saying with this is that it's uh, there's some hesitancy in listing conditions because you don't want to not list everything. And so it's more about working with the student and working with the student and the family and the doctor physician to get the proper documentation, um, you know, to make that happen. OK, but there's probably more underlying conditions than we kind of just would come to think through ourselves, so. Right, right, and I'm sure the CDC website will have more information on that as well. Yeah. Any updates on spring graduation date? Is the date still set or will it change? Right now, that's the date. We're following that calendar. OK, so if something's going to change. We will get to you pretty quickly, but I would say the published calendar for spring, the modified one that started on the 14th, is the calendar we're following. OK, so. <clears throat> And then that, any updates on the impact of spring rush as it relates to uh, our Greek community on COVID numbers on campus? Yeah, so, you know, spring rush is supposed to be virtual. OK, that was the agreed plan with our Greek leaders. OK, what I want people to realize is that all of the Greek leadership, pres uh, chapter presidents and stuff, turn over in January. OK, that's the model we've always had is that they new membership steps in in January. OK, so much of the work that we were able to do with the group that was in place since last January through part of the spring term when we really entered COVID through the summer, through the fall, have now stepped away and we have a new set of leaders. OK, and so we work very closely now in making sure that all of the messaging, all of the important pieces, all of the expectations and concerns that we have are known to that group. And in trying to meet that goal, <coughs> excuse me, we had a Thursday evening meeting, it was five o'clock I think, with President Cabrera and myself and all of the Greek life staff with all of the leadership of the new chapters, men and women. Okay, and the president spoke to them and expressed one, his appreciation for their leadership but also his kind of expectations uh, of them in working with us. There was an agreed plan for virtual rush this semester. 
Now, if for some reason you find out through your student that that's not what's happening, I would suggest that you let us know so that we can follow up with that. OK, we are monitoring the Greek houses very, very closely right now, and we're also monitoring our residence halls, um, but we are monitoring very closely. We have already done an intervention on two houses where we felt that there was the potential for things rising in terms of some uh, numbers and stuff. So we kind of jumped on that and are working with the students in two of the fraternities right now as we monitor the others and uh, also residence halls. We know Atlanta as a city is very open, but is the Institute maintaining stricter COVID precautions? We're maintaining very strict precautions. Um, you know, to get into our library, you have to have a buzz card uh, and access through the buzz card. OK, uh, buildings are locked down um, at, after business hours as a way of not having individuals come in and out um, and after buildings have been cleaned uh, or disinfected and stuff. So yes, um, on events, everyone coming in or whatever, if it's an in-person, uh, we are getting IDs because we have to for contact tracing purposes. So we are, there's a lot of guidelines. You have to register an event. It has to be approved in terms of having that event. You have to demonstrate that you have all the pieces in place to protect the community. So I, yeah, I feel really good about that. And I want uh, to reassure you that we're taking some major, major um, precautions here. Now, in saying that, what I will say is that students are not on lockdown. So students can access the city and elsewhere and be out in the world just like the rest of us and then come back, right? So the, that piece is also, um, you know, part of the difficulty here is just, you know, people who, anyone, faculty, staff, students who are just out and about and then can, being engaged with other people and be exposed to other people. <clears throat> Dean Stein, can you talk briefly about the current guidelines for students who have been exposed to COVID in terms of quarantine and going into in-person classes such as labs? Yeah, <clears throat> so um, if you are exposed, you need to notify us, okay, through the health center confidentially that you have been, okay, unless it's picked up through our own testing program here. Uh, you're then supposed to go into quarantine. At that point, my office, the Dean of Students office, is notified that you have uh, been moved into quarantine or isolation, depending on um, if you're symptomatic or not. We then notify your professor, okay? Just that there's a reason that you're not in class. We do not expose in medical information and stuff, but we do say that there's a reason that uh, you cannot be in class and ask them to work with you and allow you to make up the lab that you've missed. Okay. Some of these labs, though, I know are being done virtually right now, but if it's not, then that faculty member is supposed to work out a plan with you to either excuse you for that lab or to find a time that you would be able to make up the lab because you should not be penalized for something that, you know, you're dealing with uh, medically. So. If study abroad is a go this summer, will the students be able to get both uh, COVID-19 vaccine doses before they depart? That would be the hope that we would be able to do that. Yes. Um, and you know where again that those decisions will be made, I would say fairly soon. Uh, some have been made already. Others, there has to be kind of deadlines to meet. So as we move into February, I think we're going to see a number of programs that will make the decision to go or not go. Now, sometimes what I'll say is that decisions are being made for us because countries or other universities in other countries are telling us that they are not allowing it to happen. So it's again, it's a two-way street here 
of us making a decision or someone else making a decision that's affecting our program. OK, so um, some decisions have been made, not many, uh, and uh, we will be moving ahead with those decisions probably in the next few weeks. Einstein, this next question is uh, pretty direct, so we may need to uh, direct them to our parent inbox, but you may have some insight on it. Why is the Homestyle Station at the ex Exhibition Hall not open? Uh, will it open later this semester? It seems that dining options are reduced, even though there are more students on campus, in particular for using meal swipes. Yeah, that a great question. I, I don't have the answer to that, but we, we should direct that to dining um, specifically and get an answer and then post it. OK, so a very good point. Uh, see, these are the things sometimes that we don't even know may be occurring. All right. And when you bring that to our attention, it's a great example of something that we then can follow up with. So thank you. Yes, thank you so much. <laughs> will vaccines be mandatory? No. University system will not allow us to really uh, re make it a mandatory thing. Highly, highly recommended, but no. Is there a form for students uh, for their doctor to complete in order to get into the priority group 1C for underlying conditions? What is the process? Yeah, so um, great question. Uh, I'm not sure if there's a form, but I will follow up with Dr. Holton to see how he's assessing uh, that situation. And so let me let me follow up with Dr. Holton uh, after this and we'll figure that out. Why has the administration of GT? Uh, I'm trying to see how the phrase is. Why doesn't the administration give guidelines to teachers for establishing when a class should be in person or online, depending on the size of the class? Even this semester, there are small classes that are still online. Uh, example would be, I guess, a Chinese language course. Yeah, I, we do give guidelines, um, but again, it's up to the individual faculty member uh, to make the decision in terms of one's own health, one's own uh, concerns about teaching in person versus um, online. And so, um, you know, it, it, it and that, that those negotiations then occur with the chair of the department and then the dean of that college needs to sign off. OK, so there is a process. I don't want you know people to think that we don't have a process, but um, it, it's not just if it's, you know, 25 or less, it has to be in person um, because there are reasons why sometimes even at that low census, it would not be in person. Okay, I, I'm teaching a freshman seminar this semester. I have a very small class. I am choosing to do it in person. We meet weekly and um, and the students know that it is a fully residential. I am not doing a hybrid model, um, you know, uh, but they also know that if for some reason, you know, half the class has to quarantine and stuff, then we'll have to figure out another plan. And for a period of time, we may have to uh, move online. Uh, to get through that period so we will we will work with whatever comes up but i wasn't told that i had to do that um, in terms of being a residential i i chose to do it so are students having to have a negative test prior to entering campus buildings uh no uh they they don't as i said we, what we said was that we wanted students to test two times upon returning back uh, because we wanted them to be clear as to if they were um, positive or not. Uh, if they're in quarantine, they do have to test before they leave quarantine uh, to make sure that they uh, at that point can come come out. So. Does Georgia Tech have a way to track the new COVID-19 uh, variant strains that are amidst us? Great, great question. Again, a technical question uh, for Dr. Halton, and uh, I will bring that 
uh, to um, his attention. OK, I apologize that I don't have the answers to all these questions, but some of these are just questions that um, Dr. Holton and his staff are really uh, focused on. Uh, and typically what happens is that he would bring that information to the task force, and that's how we learn the answers to some of these questions. <clears throat> If students had COVID last semester, would they be expected to quarantine if they have if they are close contact with someone who tests positive this semester? That is a Dr. Holton question. OK, again, uh, on these questions, what we do is we typically would um, get to Dr. Holton. One of the first questions Dr. Holton would ask is how long ago did this occur? All right, so sometimes he wants to just know the duration of time that the student had it and stuff. So, um, you know, we do look at each case and figure out what the best plan should be for the individual student and for the community. It seems that some large classes, 400 plus, have technical difficulties with audio with the uh, different platforms utilized for synchronous instruction. Is there any way that this situation can be corrected, in particular introduction to physics one. This may be something that we pass on to Dr. Gerardo and his team. Absolutely, see again, that's something that's good for us to know. And now we will make sure that physics um, and, and the faculty know that. Uh, Dr. Gerardo um, organizes that, that class. And so uh, we will make sure that uh, that's been brought to our attention and have them address it and we should be able to address it, so. Um, I have another question for you, Dean Stein. My student I, can I go? Let me just go back to that point, because sure. one of the things I wanted to say is that if your student is saying that to you, I, one of the questions, and you might already be doing this, but one of the questions I hope you would do is to ask the question, have you told your professor that? Okay, and ask them if they haven't, to email the professor and just say, you know, for the second time, it's very difficult to hear you. And I'm sure other students might be experiencing the same thing. Is there any way to correct this? But let's make sure that the students are also notifying their professors when there's issues like that. Okay, thank you. Yes, of course. Uh, the next question that I have for you, Dean Stein, is uh, over the break, I learned that my student um, had a tough semester with grades and making friends, any advice on how I can just help them along the way this semester to encourage them, help them stay positive. They, they seem really down about their bad first semester at Georgia Tech. Yeah, yeah, uh, tough. You know, the first semesters are difficult at Georgia Tech under any circumstances, but first semesters uh, under COVID, uh, a, a number of students struggled last semester. OK, so I think one of the things to do is to just put it in perspective with them to get them to try and understand that. OK, um, and you know, the nice thing about college is that every semester is a new beginning. The slate is washed clean and you start all over. OK, and you have the opportunity to do better this semester. My recommendation is to have, you know, your student meet with one of them and they can choose who they want to but a conversation with either their academic advisor with one of the academic coaches in the center for student success or one of us in the dean of students office would be very very beneficial okay and this is you know what i did in my class my freshman seminar last week was to get students to reflect on last semester okay what went well what didn't go well? What did they learn? What would they do differently? You know, and to kind of just have that understanding and that reflection on the semester. And I think, you know, whoever is asked saying this and asking this, a conversation with someone to just reflect on the semester um, would be very insightful for your student and potentially motivating. And that that's the place that I would start. And then secondly, with that is you know, really establishing some very basic goals for this semester. These are the two or three things I want to accomplish. And, and I don't, again, mean like 4-0, you know, but two or three realistic goals 
that one could work towards to get through the semester and feel more of a sense of success. And if you feel that, then you're more motivated. OK, but we don't want it to just be, <clears throat> excuse me, an extension of last semester because then it's going to end with a year of really not feeling very good about the whole experience. I hope that helps. How do, how do students find out if they have academic honors last semester? Are letters sent to their home address, et cetera? So academic honors, so, so we're not talking about graduating students. We're talking about just no. students that end the semester. Right. OK, so if a student goes to their transcript, OK, um, they can look it up online and you know they will see one of two statuses at the end of that semester that signal honors. One is Dean's List and the other is Faculty Honors. Okay, Dean's List is 3-0 or better. So if you end the semester with a 3-0 or better, you earn Dean's List. If you end the semester with straight A's, 4-0, that's faculty honors. OK, if you fell short of 3-0, but you're above the minimum, you'll see good standing. OK, if you're below the minimum GPA for your class, you'll see one of two, depending on how low it is, either warning or academic probation. OK, so those are the different faculty honors, dean's list, good standing, warning, and academic probation. OK, but every semester they can see where they are. All right. Uh, but in order to earn Dean's List and faculty honors, you must maintain 12 credits through the whole semester. You have to maintain full time status. So if you fall below and have 11 credits and earn a 4-0, you will not be granted faculty honors for that semester. You will still have a 4-0 but it will not be acknowledged as faculty honors. Our next question, uh, will Georgia Tech consider a special grade replacement provisions for students who struggle with COVID-19, COVID instruction settings and COVID anxiety? No, we, we don't. We don't have a special uh, one. Um, that, that's not something that we would consider. Uh, again, uh, what I would say is that if there's any, if there's a really specific question about that, then it's best to um, meet with either an academic advisor or someone in the dean's office to talk that through. <clears throat> there might be other options, but we don't have a special. Speaking of first semester struggles and new starts, could the RAs try again to form communities in their dorm? My son didn't meet anyone in his hallway other than the RA last semester. A lot of GT kids are shy and need someone to help, need someone else to help make the first step to pull these students together. I know it's silly, but that is how it is for a chunk of them. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not silly. It's not silly at all. It's a, it's a very real piece of Georgia Tech. OK, um, we, we know we have a population of students uh, that for whatever reason, um, these things don't come easily to so it's not it's not silly it's very important um you know every time i meet with a residence life and housing I, I talk to them about this in terms of really making sure ras are engaging in this case what i'm going to say is i want whatever parent out there who just mentioned this to either email tyler or email me give us the building okay and the floor <laughs> that your son or daughter is living on and let us address this and we will protect the identity. We will not mention the name, but we will make sure that a specific intervention is made uh, in this case. But generally, we will again ask the RAs to um, you know, uh, be doing this. They should be doing it. Now, again, in my class last week, I realized that we have first year students living in eight street apartments, which is not typical of where we would place first year students. We would place them in freshman residence halls, but we, we didn't have the room, OK? And I called right over after class and asked the residence life staff to connect with those students. I mean, they're first year students. They're new this semester. They're living in apartments. Um, they're not meeting people 
and the feeling very isolated. Okay, and so I was promised that the RA would make contact with these students, talk to them, try to get them to meet other people right in that vicinity of what, where they're living and know how to connect with others, so. My, my out-of-state student didn't get any GT financial aid. He did well in his first semester, in the first semester, excuse me, and he hopes he to continue to do well. He has applied for financial aid for the upcoming 2021-2022 school year. Will GT consider him for merit-based financial aid for his second year? Great question. And what I would say is if that's going to come, it would come from more the department. So what your son or daughter should do, I can't remember she said son or daughter. Son, yes. Son. Okay. What your son should do is to make contact um, with their advisor in whatever major they're on to say, are there scholarships available to students in their second year who have performed at a high level? Okay, because sometimes the department has scholarships that they work with financial aid that are specifically for a second year student or an upper class student or a student who's earned a GPA of X or higher. So that's typically how it, it's done. We have probably time for one more. Yes, yes. Um, I actually currently don't see any in the chat box. So I, what I'll do is just give it to you, Dean Stein, for any closing remarks. Sure. Well, look, I mean, we're in our second, the very beginning of our second full week. So we're very early in the semester. Uh, we have a full semester ahead of us. OK, uh, we're excited. Uh, you know, students are with us or physically or virtually. Uh, you know, if issues come up, please contact us. Uh, let's all, you know, remain hopeful uh, that we're all heading in the right direction uh, and that, uh, you know, we're all going to do our very, very best to make this a very wonderful semester for your students and a very safe one for your students. And so I thank you for your support. Um, uh, and really, it's always a pleasure to spend some time with you. Yes, thank you so much, Dean Stein. And we would just like to thank all of our parents and family members <laughs> on the webinar today. Uh, please know that this will be recorded so you can go back to it and watch it and um, share some nuggets with your student about this semester and some things that you've learned. Also, please know that we have another webinar today at 3 p.m. with our SEPC, our Student Center um, Programs Council, um, and they will be talking about some ways to get involved, some ways to make new friends, some ways to attend different events on campus. Um, so definitely uh, tune in to that at 3 p.m. Uh, the link is in your email uh, that we sent out via our uh, update with the parent newsletter today, this morning. And also, if you just don't have access to that, please feel free to visit our website as well to get access to the link so you can join us. Um, but with that being said, and then also tomorrow, we have a very uh, big webinar, a very important webinar as the career fair is this week. And so tomorrow we will be joined by Michael Lauder, who works in the career fair, um, excuse me, the career center. And he'll just be talking about um, interview tips, uh, resume writing, salary negotiation skills. So please tune in to that as well tomorrow, and it'll be at 12 p.m. And our, like I said, our full uh, calendar schedule can be found in your email. Well, thank you so much and have a nice day. See you at 3 p.m.